Hello and welcome to Bunny Hop. My name is George Weedman and I have with me Star Long and Richard Garriott. The, uh, these, these guys are some of the uh, <laughs> veritable creators of RPGs as we know them today. And you were actually one of the few space tourists yep. ever. Um, I guess, how, how, how have you guys been so far? How's the con been for you guys so far? Oh, I think it's been great. You know, I, I was the guest at Dragon Con 1 almost 30 years ago. <laughs> And, uh, and attended the first like 15 before I took a break. And uh, uh, then took about a five year break. Uh, but then I, I come back about every other year now and uh, I just love Dragon Con. And this one in particular, I actually think the quality of uh, at least the panels I've attended and or been on are you know better than ever. So I mean, and I mean that seriously, this is, uh, I'm often disappointed by panels. This, this is the year where I've actually not been, I've not been disappointed with anything I've gone to see yet. Cool, cool. And um, I guess one, one, one thing I've always kind of wanted to know are uh, maybe some of the less glamorous aspects of like private space tourism. Like uh, the, the paperwork involved, the liability, was, was it? Oh, uh, toothpaste. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, this, sound, this sounds interesting. Well, so, yeah, so actually the, the, the you know, while there are some hassles associated with government paperwork entanglements and medical tests and qualification, uh, the, 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 the flight of the launch and being in space and the view of the Earth is all spectacular. Uh, there are two things that aren't the best things in the world about being in space. One is the food's just not that great. You know, you're, you're eating milit you're literally eating, you know, room temperature military rations. Is, so. is it, is it really that like fries dried ice cream stuff? No, in fact, uh, freeze dried ice cream that they still sell, uh, only flew once in space. I think it was Apollo 8, uh, who was taken in, uh, on a, on a flight, but otherwise it's uh, for the public. Um, but uh, what Star was, what Star's comment about toothpaste was really <laughs> associated with the problems of using the restroom in space, which is the worst thing. <laughs> Personal hygiene is difficult in general. There's no running water or bathing facilities, but uh, uh, but the but the space toilet, which is uh, you know has a liquid waste receptacle and a solid waste receptacle. Liquid waste you just pee into a funnel that's connected to a vacuum, so that's. Pretty easy. Where, where does it go? It actually gets stored. It goes through a centrifuge where the air bubbles or the air is separated from the liquids. Uh, the liquids are actually recycled oh, back into oh drinking dear. water. Oh dear! And uh, and the gases are for the gases are filtered and put back into your breathing air. And uh, the, but the solid waste. <laughs> The solid waste goes into uh, you, you straddle over a shoebox uh, size toilet seat with uh, airflow going down through a little plastic bag with perforations in the bottom to hopefully collect the feces that come out of you. So, so there's like a kind of vacuum you have just to a little bit squat of uh, just over. a little bit of airflow. <laughs> but but the problem is that like toothpaste, uh, uh, it, it, you know, if you if you if you squeeze toothpaste out in zero g, it just keeps coming out. It doesn't drop anywhere because there's no gravity. Mm -hmm. And well, same things with stuff coming out of you, it's hard to separate yourself from it. And, uh, and uh, it ends up being uh, rather a difficult uh, procedure to not make things quite messy what, during. What wonderful. This has been a very educational talk yeah. so far already. Yeah. And so besides that, you, uh, you were able to get into space partly because of the success with the Ultima series back in the uh, That's true. 80s and 90s. Yes, Thank yes, you, yes. Thank you, Ultima fans. Yes, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about Ultima. What are um, like the night and day the most major differences between games development nowadays versus the early '80s when when you were doing Ultimas, early '80s through '90s? Well, the early '80s, yes. Yeah, so there's kind of two eras. Even I would put into that '80s and '90s is a bigger yeah. is a big shift. Yeah. Ultima four and previous were games you could make by yourself. And, which uh, is so, kind which of is, similar to what's going on with a lot of people now. Uh, well, even nowadays, it's still hard to do literally by yourself. I mean, I, I was the programmer, the artist, the writer, yeah. the everything. And you can argue with whether the graphics were any good. It, uh, but I assume it was never easy at any time for anyone to make a game by themselves. No. right? Uh, well, there was really no need to get much help. There really wasn't much help you could get. There were no art tools to make art, so you couldn't really even hire an artist to help much because the... Tiles were only you know a few pixels wide by a few t pixels tall. Hardly justifies an artist. Um, but uh, but starting with Ultima Five, we did start needing teams. And by the time we got up to Ultima Online, um, you know the teams, the, the money involved and the team sizes, you know it suddenly became many millions of dollars. And teams uh, often now getting into the hundreds. Uh, yeah, but that which is one of the reasons we're so excited about the current era where the trend is finally re reversing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why the trend is reversing is because of tools. 
almost every game we've worked, in fact, I think literally every game we've worked on previously, we had to rewrite the tools from scratch. And I mean the tools to do things like draw a pixel on the screen, uh, much less all the other user interface and you know other tools that you might need to make a world. Uh, but now that we're finally able to start using off-the-shelf tools, better off-the-shelf tools, means the team size can uh, team size and time and money all reduce. In comparison, was it an expensive endeavor to do a one-man game back then, or uh, was well, no? It... My first games when I was paying paying myself, yeah. my salary was zero. And so the so cost investment zero. into Ultima 1 through f zero, a Calibeth through Ultima 4, the development cost in dollars was zero uh, because I just did them myself. And I got and I was paid royalties either from the companies that I posted through originally or through our own company origin. So I guess they didn't have like development tools you licensed off back then? There, there, there were, there were there, you mean, close to zero. Okay. Yeah, the, there, I mean, there was, like, there weren't any really. Even something as simple and obvious as a compiler. You had to do it all yourself. Compilers didn't exist until later. Or at least not, not on personal computers. Yeah. And so, yeah, so, uh, you know, a, a Calibath and Ultima 1 written in BASIC. You know, Ultima 2 was the first assembly language program I ever wrote directly in assembly language. I mean, I coded it in uh, hex or three letter acronyms directly into the machine. Uh, same thing with Ultima 3. I think. Maybe by Ultima 4, we might have had an assembler that was useful at some level. Uh, and maybe, I'm not even sure if we had, we had to pay for it. But, but yeah, there were, there were, but there basically were, were you know, very, very close to zero cash expenses. But the economics of the gaming industry changed, started changing rapidly as soon as you started having to really invest real yeah, money. Yeah, I, I guess games. even the one-man project still would have to, to license off Today you would. for engines and tools and yeah. software. And, and whatever platform you're going to distribute on. I mean, because we now are in an era where anybody can make. I mean, between distribution platforms, the, avail the availability of tools like Unity and Unreal and... Uh, uh, and all the distribution like Steam and the Android Marketplace and the App Store. I mean, anybody can make, and and it you know it's kind of the best of times and worst of times because everyone can make, so everyone is making. So we're making a lot of a lot of content, um, and which does not mean a lot of good content, right? Uh, but but <laughs> that's, you know, even that's, in this, that's an interesting yeah. debate going on now too. Yeah. And even with the small team, though, I mean, you are you do have expenses. Uh, because and you're not getting all the revenue, right? So wherever you're distribute you're distributing on whatever that platform is, whether it's the app store or the marketplace, they're getting cut too. Okay. Yeah. So at, at Ultima four through six, that's when I, I noticed the story is getting a lot more complicated at that point. Um, the the morality in the games, it's kind of a, a free for all before then, and then all of a sudden you get into the quest about virtues, and then there's like this uh, empathetic evil faction in Ultima six that turns out to think you're the bad guy is the twist, which which, which is neat. I was uh, wanted to ask, how do you um, like police or encourage player morality or uh, kind of try to influence player morality through RPG game design? It's interesting you pick up on that because, of course, I feel strongly on this uh, subject. Uh, and the first is, uh, let me explain how and why it happened. Mm -hmm. Ultimas 1 through 3, or uh, Calabeth and 1, 2 especially, were published through other companies. And so I never really knew how people played them. Ultima 3 was the first game we published as Origin. And so it was the first time I saw letters written in by people who played the games. And it was interesting in these games that I thought I was writing these games about you're the hero to go save the world. How people were writing in that they played it is, yeah, well, you know, I sort of played the storyline, but what I really liked to do was kill all the villagers, steal from every shop, and of course kill you, Lord British. And, and uh, then there had to be consequences. And, and then at the end, they killed the bad guy, but the bad guy, frankly, had never done anything to be deserving <laughs> of being killed in the end compared to what you had done on the way there. It's like a twist. Yeah, and so I said, okay, that's this, these games aren't really hitting the way, they're not being received the way I expected. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a little gotcha game, and I'm going to write this game where, uh, it, 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 first of all, to be about virtue, that's where I invented the term avatar. Um, some people, youngsters in the industry, don't realize that the term avatar, which is now ubiquitous, comes from this game. I actually heard it outside of this context before learning later on that it came from Ultima, yeah. Right. And, but, and the reason why it came into this particular game first is before that, if you play a role-playing game, you might play the role of, say, Conan the Barbarian. And if you are, you should succeed or fail based on how well you role-play Conan the Barbarian. 
But if I don't want you to play Conan the Barbarian, I want you to play this person of virtue. I want you, the Earthling, to feel bad about stealing or killing when you do it. It was important that this is not, you're not role-playing Conan, you're role-playing you. And so I found, while I was doing research on virtues, I found this Sanskrit word that is used in a lot of Hindu uh, beliefs, uh, avatar, which in Hindu belief is the physical incarnation of a god on earth in human form. And I thought, ah, that's perfect, because what I want to do is this is your incarnation in my virtual world in this Verdu form. And so even though you might, on Earth, be a skinny little computer geek, and in my game might be a tough, bully, brawny person... And they do that in the opening cutscenes. There's always this weird fourth wall breaking thing where the moon gate opens up in the player's front yard. That's exactly it. And that's to help you transition that this is, that you're not role playing an alter ego. This is you in my world. So when you go kill people, I'm blaming you, not you can't you can't escape it by saying that's not me. I'm role playing Conan. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so that's why the word avatar exists as a gaming uh, term. Um, but then what I what I quickly realized and started also with Ultima Four was that um, uh, if I tell you, you're going to be judged on whether you tell the truth or a lie. And and also as soon as you tell the lie, I tell you, uh uh-uh, uh, I, I know you're telling a lie. Well then, of course you're going to tell the truth all the time because you know you can't get away with it right you if enforcement is 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 a hundred percent of the time and instantaneous then you're never you're never going to be you're never going to be seduced to trying to get away with it and so quickly i realized that if i'm gonna if i want to let people fall to their natural level of misbehavior <laughs> i need to desynchronize the act and the cause and the result of the, the act and so uh, the game keeps, uh, in fact, all of our games now uh, keep hidden scores of how it interprets you. And the an advantage of a hidden score is not only does it desynchronize those two events, but also means you don't know exactly which events we're testing. And so it, you have to sort of be on your guard in all situations, since you don't know which situations are being judged and how. And, uh, uh, and that way we just keep these meta scores running in the background. And uh, and later in the game, if you've been stealing, you know, from the shopkeepers as most people used to do, uh, you know, you might need some help, and they'll say, "Sorry, I'd love to help you if you were the hero I thought you were, but you're the most dishonest thieving scumbag I've ever met." Yeah. So off with you. Yeah, I love that. That like chrono trigger moment halfway through you see all the characters give you a trial based on the video game things you were doing Mm -hmm. um two years ago i think uh you said this at dragon con but you were also saying in a few interviews that uh you thought consoles were doomed that the uh power of handhelds and portables were coming to eclipse what we know is the consoles and now that it's 2014 and there's a new generation of consoles out do you still think that's the case Uh, i think in the long term that's still the case Mm -hmm. now um uh, uh, and even when I made said it before, I, I, I do think this current round of consoles coming out now mm-hmm. uh, uh, is, good, is going to do quite is going to do well. Um, the but the long term prognosis, if you think about it, you know we, we didn't used to have handheld devices, right? That's a new, that's a new add into yeah. the mix, and um, uh, and you go like, well, which ones of these are are have the legs? Why you know how many how many different devices are we going to have? Is it always going to be an increasing palette? Of devices, or is there any time that turn will be, something else? some will eventually be yeah. fully antiquated? My case in the long run against the way consoles are interpreted now, and what I mean by a console is a machine that requires you, when each new version comes out, to disconnect it from your stereo system and reinsert a new one into your stereo system. The, it, that interpretation of console, the reason why I think that will, in the long run, have difficulty is because I don't think it is will be needed. I think your television is not only has a lot of electronics built into it now, but it's also on the internet. And the computation capability of the cloud is pretty substantial now. We do lots of the games process a lot of their information now somewhere in the cloud. And in fact, a control you will need a controller, yeah. but the the controller can have a lot of a form of of electronics in it too. And so I'm going, why do I need to reinstall something in my stereo? It might just be between my either my phone as a controller or the or maybe I'll need a joystick controller, but we can put a bunch of electronics in there that can talk to the cloud, that can talk to the TV. And so I'm just not I'm not sure there's a need for a, where why that particular hardware arrangement is critical. That, that, that's that's it, it, it kind of scares the shit out of me, actually. I don't know. Um, it's I might, might be because of the way I've been used to it so long. But the idea of uh, having consoles and gaming devices turn into streaming devices that uh, just kind of use the computing power on the cloud rather than on uh, your own hardware locally kind of always worries me and uh, for a lot of reasons, one of which is... Uh, 
could be but, preservation but, but by the way, and history. My, my future predictions mm -hmm. are 50-50 at best. Oh, oh yeah. I've I nearly mean, put my company out of business future. a few times. If you, want to, <laughs> if you actually want to talk to a good futurist, this guy did a, did a, does a talk on uh, the future, particularly technology trends in, uh, in gaming. Uh, that I think are, 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 are uh, well, I'm not sure we had the chance to test the reliability. Yet. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not, yeah, I would, I would think it's a hasty uh, prediction, just like the prediction that AAA games are going to go away, right? Yeah. I, 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 what I think is, uh, and I think the opportunity is, is a much more collaborative space between these deeper sort of immersive games and uh, the lighter casual games and the kinds of interface and experiences you can have on a, a mobile device versus a dedicated device. And like a great example of something that's happening now is uh, The Division, where players who are playing on their consoles and playing the shooter are playing alongside drone operators who are using their iPad to, to operate the drone. And that's a great example of like the two devices living together in the same game experience. Um, and I, I'm, I've always been, or at least in the near term, I'm a much more intrigued by uh, what I call the local cloud versus the, the distributed local. cloud. And the, what I mean by the local cloud is um, to, to sort of riff on what Richard was pointing out is like, everything in your house, it's this sort of internet of things, right? So you're, everything in your house has computing power now, right? And, uh, and, and what's great about it is the uh, ping times to all your devices to each other at, in your house is much shorter than any ping time you're going to get to uh, cloud a distributed cloud process that's happening on the internet. So, would a local cloud would like the Steam in-house streaming be an example of that? No, when I say, I'm talking about all the devices, so your TV, your phone, uh, your uh, your microwave, Sonos. your Sonos, your fridge, all have memory. They all have processors in them. They, they can uh, your Nest, uh, you know the the smoke detector thing that uh, the <coughs> Nest guys made. All those things, and you could leverage all that. Right, so uh, you know the the great example, and I still don't know why Apple hasn't done this, but you have an Apple TV, right? Mm -hmm. And you have your phone. They both you they share operating systems. So why not distributed process? Why why not distribute processing between the two of them using the phone as a controller, and then all of a sudden your Apple TV can be a console itself. So I think the idea that a uh, so and what I'm and so while it's not the death of the console, I think it's the I'm more excited by how all those things could become a console. Like your whole house could be a console, just like your entire house could be a control surface, because there's all sorts of crazy stuff happening with projected uh, user interface on uh, surfaces and AR. Yeah. Like everything in your house, your your house could be a console. That that, that has all sorts of interesting implications yeah. for AR games, which might become a thing over the next coming years too. Oh, yeah. Speaking of uh, tech trends in gaming, um, crowdsourcing is going around these days, and Shroud of the Avatar is crowdsourced. And you guys have um, stretch goals. A lot of them involve plaques, like uh, player-written plaques on houses, and and a lot of other crowdsourced games also incorporate uh, backer content for the. Um, stretch goals. And one thing that I've always wondered is, is what do game developers do if they uh, don't necessarily like <laughs> the ideas that um, fans might put down as backers? Like, uh, how do you keep players from saying, like, Dick's LOL or something on their plaque? Is there a uh, yeah, system so in the, place to... Well, there's the acronym, right? There's yeah. the TTP acronym, which is TTP? Time to Penis. Oh, okay. Uh, so <laughs> anytime you make a game that has UGC in it, uh, user-generated content. There's a time. Uh, there's, a, to there's a time. How there's long, a, will, how it long will it take? Yeah. Someone and uh, like uh, you know, everyone saw uh, spore porn, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a time it took that. Like I mean, I literally think it was about uh, four hours from the time that they released the creature creator for Spore, and there were before there was a penis monster. I, I don't know why I'm surprised that there's an actual insider industry term for this. Yeah, I'm surprised. That makes sense. <laughs> oh yeah, and I'm surprised more people don't know about it, but it totally happens all the time, and so. Uh, Two things. One, you know, we just have clear ground rules, which is like, you know, everything submitted by players has to be approved by us. We don't have just an open pipe that you can just put stuff in the game without us approving it. Uh, but even if stuff gets past that, you know, we rely on the community to report things that, and then we can take care of it. I mean, like for instance, we have a home, a very sophisticated home customization decoration scheme, yeah. which theoretically you can use to for that TTP. You yeah. can buy a clever arrangement of paintings on the wall or things on the ground. You can spell words or make, make shapes, shapes. You know, pictures, images, exactly. Yeah, images. Which, which actually is, we're, we're shockingly free of it so far. Well, we're, we're dealing with the very... Don't give them ideas. Yeah, yeah we, we'll, give them ideas. 
Uh, well, we're live. We're, the game is live right now yeah. this weekend, uh, and so people, the players might, you know, uh, <laughs> get bad ideas. A call to action. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm wondering how exactly multiplayer works because it does have um, player-created houses, and economies are cropping up right now. And but it, it also, I, I read that it's going to be a very story-driven game as well, and that's the classic yeah. conflict between multiplayer modes and story-driven modes. Sure, but if anybody can tackle this, our team is the one to do it. I think. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we we built nine solo player Ultimas all. All story driven. We created Ultima Online that benefited from the deep fictional background all that had and the backdrop of virtues, etc., but was really a sandbox, uh, you know, exploration game. Uh, I, even, even when we started down that path, we, uh, be, we, you know, we believed we could do both at the same time. It is, however, even harder than doing one or the other. Uh, and so we had to think long and hard about how do you meter out story because the, 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 the trick for a story in a multiplayer setting is that the beauty of a solo, solo player setting is you are the hero. You are the only person on earth who is going to be the chosen one to yeah. save the day. And in multiplayer games, and, they kind of process and in the multi, heroes. Yeah, and, in exactly. And it's in a multiplayer game, you can't. So that's, yeah. that's the crux of the difficulty of how to make you feel like you are the man in a multiplayer setting. So there's two things we've had to do. One is technical, and one is uh, uh, st story concept. The technical thing we've had to do is to say is to make sure that the game was capable of of putting you into a private space to tell you a private message that that you want to be mercifully free of anybody else thinking that they have that same experience. Because don't forget, in a solo player game, you don't mind calling your friend on the phone and going like, "Hey, how did you get past this place in the game?" Because since he's not in your reality, you still feel proud of your specialness in your reality. Yeah. Okay, so part of it we do that by segregation. However, that still means, you know, if, if, if there's only going to be one Jedi Knight, if you were doing a Star Wars property or something, uh, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you wouldn't want to see a bunch of others you know, running around at the same time. And that was, and that was a thing they had to account for as, sure. as Star Wars Galaxies went exactly. on. Exactly. Yeah. How, how rare is yeah. my breed? The rules for that changed considerably. And, and so, so what we've had to do is set up a story that I don't want to give away the, 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 the final piece of this. But the the the, the part of the, the main part of uh, of the end of the first episode of our five part story does accommodate the fact that there will be more than one person reaching this point. I think I read about uh, a a um, quest activated PvP event where once you take on this quest, all of a sudden you're free game for other players. There, your your game play shifts when you get close to the end of episode one. And in episode two, we'll explore a whole other, uh, you know, round of, of uh, your growth. Okay. Uh, but it, but it is it, we believe that the combination of both giving you private storytelling moments and creating a story that uh, that plays well with the fact that uh, there isn't explicitly only you uh, makes it. We think we can do a good job of storytelling in a, in a multiplayer setting. And, and and another another way we're tackling it too is that. Uh, because we're making the the world be uh, more of a sandbox, um, and, and that's the sort of underpinning, of the simulation layer that sits underneath everything. And then we're building all of the narrative elements on top of that, versus trying to make a narrative experience and then trying to introduce some simulation and world stuff on on top of that. And so that because we are d putting the narrative on top of the simulation layer, we think that. That's how they can coexist peacefully. And, and if you think about it, that's how we sort of did even the solo player Ultimas, uh, you know, seven, yeah. eight, and nine. If you look it, at those, it, it feels like there's a world before right, the story exactly. was. And you was know, unlike added it, compare it to say it. World of Warcraft, which even don't worry about whether it had a story or not, it's level gated, right? There's a you can you can you can exist here as level one, then a little bigger as level two, a little more as level three, a little more as level four. Uh, Ultimas were never that way. Even though they had linear stories, you could go anywhere you wanted at any time. I just had to be very careful to make sure there were multiple entry points. If you went way off course, there was still a way to get back on the th right thread, and there were always multiple threads you could be working on at various parts of the world. Okay. And so uh, that's how. So I think our method of storytelling already plays well with the sandbox world underneath. Okay, cool. And and I am looking forward to it, but this is kind of a superficial judgment, but at first glance you can see that the graphics in Shroud of the Avatar aren't currently super duper fancy. Is is um that's something you guys had to compromise on or was it never were fancy graphics really a priority in the first place for this project? Well, if so uh, a little bit of both. Uh, you know, for for us 
uh, you know, we don't have a hundred million dollars, so right, we're not right. going to go build an engine from scratch and try to make the truly the most cutting edge visual engine. Yeah. But by the way, that was never really what was Ultima in the past. Oh, anyway. oh yeah, especially in the beginning. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, while we always tried to make sure we had good visuals, we never felt that we had to compete on that as the primary method of comp competition. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, we do want to make sure that our graphics capabilities are as strong as possible. And we think we are not yet to the point where we're fully leveraging the Unity engine. We we see demos that Unity themselves has done, have done uh, uh, that that are doing a better job than we are leveraging Unity. So we do plan to leverage Unity to its fullest extent. And so we just tackle different problems at different times. If you look back at our brief existence as a project, you know we started by literally only things we could buy on the Unity asset store because we had no art. We've slowly been replacing that with art we at least built internally. We then, uh, only a month or two ago, completely revised our lighting model. So it's something we think does a much better job with lighting. And we've been of late we're kind of sitting back going, like, okay, now how do we take our visuals and animations now to the next level up? So we'll continue to punch those up, though we still don't think that's going to be the number one selling point. Yeah, and, and what's important to note, too, is uh, most games only show visuals for their game when they're done. Right, they, and you they, guys are right. and, and, showing and so it earlier you, stages. From the right. beginning, that's yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so we're we're developing out in the open and being very transparent, doing monthly releases to our backers. I mean, this we're in the ninth release right now, so we've been doing it for nine months, and we're not even alpha yet. And so all the visuals everyone is looking at are, you know, pre-alpha visuals, which no one in their right mind would show pre-alpha videos. People are doing it nowadays though. Like I was playing a pre-alpha of the new Unreal Tournament like a couple weeks ago and it looked, uh, it didn't look good, but it was still, it was still fun to totally play. Was. And it, that's, that's a thing right. happening nowadays. Right. A lot more people are doing that. Yeah, and, and, and so I think the, the, the challenge for us from uh, educating the user is what you're playing and what you're seeing is at an uh, not complete state, mm -hmm. but it's being the the challenge is they're judging at it is if it's a complete game, and so yeah. and if you look at our visuals from the first release to the release, they are getting better, and we're going to continue to iterate. With that said, um, one thing that we are the primary focus of our game is the level of immersion and the the dynamic nature of the world. Like everything you see in the world, we want you to be able to interact with. Every light, we want you to be able to turn on and off. The time of day changes. There are weather. Uh, every object that you see you can pick up and move now because of that that's more important to us is maintaining that level of immersion and interactivity in the environment than being able to have the absolute prettiest visuals right you know and, and that's a give and take because they both use the same resources so. and that just means you have your priorities in order well that's what we, <laughs> we think, think. Yeah. like like we think it's more important to have a world that you can that everything you see that you think you should be able to do something with acts like you think it should that's more important to us than, uh, and and because that that takes the same resources of memory processing power as it would take to make it look really super badass and shiny. You'll notice like the games that have some of the best lighting and visuals, uh, they don't do things like change the time of day. They don't do things like let you turn on and off every single light because they pre bake all that lighting in there. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and dynamism, I guess. Dynamic well, I mean, lighting like, comes like why, with it. Why there are daytime maps and nighttime maps mm -hmm. in shooters. <laughs> The, the, the sun isn't moving while you're playing a shooter. Yeah, and but they can they can make up for that sometimes. Like, I, I, which is great. By the way, yeah. I mean, uh, there's tons of you know. I love real time strategy games. I love first person shooters. They do what they do great. You know, we're yeah. uh, uh, but that's not what we're making. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. If you guys have any other details, I think um, that's all all the questions I had prepared for you. Right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, shroudoftheavatar.com, mm -hmm. if people want to learn more about the project we're working on. The spiritual uh, successor to Ultima after all exactly. these years. Yeah. yeah. At uh, long last, we have At long years. last. Uh, and we're all crowdfunded, uh, so if you if you like what you see on the website and you want to help us, you can, uh, you know, help back us. Uh, but we're also crowdsourced, so we, we actively solicit music, sound effects, art, um, sometimes even code snippets uh, that, so... You know, we'll pay you in real dollars or virtual currency uh, so you can up your pledge by making content for us uh, or just participate in our community. And as part of backing us, you get to play the game in these very early rough stages every single month. Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Pleasure. I appreciated it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And have a good rest of the con. Yeah, we Thanks. We'll uh, ah, get ourselves packed up now. Okay. And um, actually, <coughs> I have uh, my microphone back here. Yep, yep, yep.